Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Welcome to Practical AI, a weekly podcast about making artificial intelligence practical, productive, and accessible to everyone. This is where conversations around AI, machine learning, and data science happen. Join the community and Slack with us around various topics of the show at changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at Practical AI FM. And now onto the show. Welcome to another Fully Connected episode where Daniel and I keep you fully connected with everything that's happening in the AI community. We'll take some time to discuss the latest AI news and dig into learning resources to help you level up on your machine learning game. I am your co-host, Chris Benson. I am Chief AI Strategist with Lockheed Martin RMS APA Innovations. And with me is my co-host, Daniel Whitenack, Data Scientist with SIL International. How's it going, Daniel? It's going great. How about with you, Chris? It's going very well. I am very excited about this episode. We've been talking about having one here uh, around New Year's, give or take. And uh, we are, are going to talk a little bit about the year behind and the year ahead. We've had so much happen that I am fully, fully psyched about this. But, you know, not not the least of which is, hey, we have done essentially our first year of the Practical AI podcast. Got some yeah, content out there. We started a thing. How about that? <laughs> we did start a thing. And you pointed out to me a little while ago that we have 25 episodes out. And, you know, when you're hosting uh, a show like this and we tend to get into our rhythm of, of putting them out. And I think it just hit me that we had a lot of content out there and a lot of stuff that I think we're both pretty proud of some pretty amazing episodes and guests that we've had this past year. Yeah. So thank you out there to all the loyal listeners and those that have been with us from the beginning and also those that are maybe this is you're just joining for the first episode. We're really excited that this thing exists now and that we're able to talk to talk about AI practically and bring on a bunch of awesome guests and have these conversations. It's been super great. We've talked to people from Nvidia and Google and uh, and all over the place. Um, it's been it's been a great year. You know, it, one of the things I really love is is the community that we've that we've built up, and uh, a lot of our listeners have joined the uh, the Slack community and joined us on LinkedIn and give us feedback and suggestions. And I got to say that when you when you wake up in the morning, like I did this morning, and we had a new listener who had joined the Slack community and was just saying, "Hey, great job!" and they say where they're listening from. It's it just feels amazing. Um, and so. I hope that more more folks will will engage us in a very direct way. It's it, this is not just a one way conversation. Yep, looking forward to a great 2019 of episodes. If if you have suggestions for topics you want to hear about, please let us know in Slack or on LinkedIn. And we're just really excited to get more plugged into the community and talk about the things that are, that are on people's minds and the things that they're having success with, the things that they're struggling with as far as AI goes. Yep. So I guess to kick things off, you know, what what really stood out to you in 2018? Yeah, I mean, we talked about a ton of things on the podcast. Of course, we talked to a lot of people, both recorded and not recorded as associated with the podcast, but also we're in the community. Uh, and, you know, I've talked to a ton of people doing workshops and other things. And I think one of the things that stood out to me this year in terms of what people were talking about when they came on the show and what I heard people talking about at conferences and that sort of thing was really around, um, you know, transitioning from talking about AI and machine learning in a strictly supervised uh, setting to these more complicated ways of, of framing problems. And, you know, things like uh, semi-supervised learning and generative models, reinforcement learning, um, we heard uh, about this a lot, you know, at least I did both on the show and off the show. We talked to uh, Wojciech Zaremba from OpenAI in episode 14, talking about uh, robots and, and reinforcement learning. And this came up several times in, in other conversations as well. And I think that this is a, a general trend that we saw in 2018, the people pushing AI and pushing it with these kind of more challenging problem statements and, and methodologies rather than just a strictly supervised setting. 
I think that's really insightful. The field of deep learning and AI in general has really expanded in 2018. I think when we were starting the year out uh, a year ago, most of the conversations I was having were around supervised learning uh, and 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 you know we were talking about CNNs, we were talking about uh, RNNs, um, and really I think there was discussion of, of GANs that were out, but not not a lot of people that I was talking to knew what to do with them. And we've really seen an explosion of of use cases for these new architectures this year. And what this technology can do in real life in a practical sense has really broadened over that time period. Yeah, that's well put, Chris, in the language that you just said. And speaking of speaking and language, I think that one other thing that really stood out to me over this year, which I think is really exciting, is kind of a shift, almost a shift back or towards um, natural language methods. We saw for a long time, mostly what people are talking about with deep learning especially was image-based and video-based stuff. So, you know, uh, style transfer and facial recognition and other things. But I think over the past, you know, uh, three, four, five months, and really uh, maybe throughout the year, maybe I just started noticing it recently, but there seems to have been a shift uh, to a lot of focus on natural language processing. We had uh, the episode where we dove into BERT, which was episode 22, which seemed to be getting a lot of press at the time. Of course, there were a lot of other advancements in in natural language, and I think that will influence what happens in 2019. You know, I I think you're absolutely right. With the NLP really, really, you know, became part of the AI, you know, conversation in a much bigger way this year. I know that I was at a a former employer and the beginning of the year, the NLP conversation was really not an AI conversation. It was, it was not about neural networks. It was about some of the, uh, the older legacy techniques. And over the course of the year, really deep learning took hold in the NLP world, uh, for us. And that, and so I'm speaking in a, in a very personal sense and, and watching that Watching that transition in an organization, in a large organization that was moving into this new set of technologies to drive its business forward was was pretty exciting. And then obviously with Bert's release, the excitement around NLP has really skyrocketed in a big way. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I've noticed skyrocket <laughs> as of recent is uh, fears about AI. Do you, do you hear about this as you're, as you're talking to your... Uh, well, as you were at the uh, Thanksgiving table with your your friends and family, were you talking about the fear of AI? Well, I, I wasn't at the Thanksgiving table because my wife has forbidden me from doing so. Um, <laughs> oh, I, it's it's yeah. off limits for for me, lest I drive her insane because I never stop. But I I do hear about it. I know that we both do a lot of conference talks and stuff, and it, there's rarely conversation or talk that, that I get into where that's not asked, where, where either the question of jobs or the question of of other fear-based things are out there. And uh, and so I spent a fair amount of time trying to share with people what's, you know, what in my view is is real and what's not and and trying to take the fear out of it so people can make rational judgments about how these tools can be used in all sorts of use cases. Yeah, and I'm thinking back to our episode uh, 25, uh, the most recent one with uh, Susan Etlinger, where we kind of talked about this kind of terminator or singularity thing, really distracting from a lot of the real world dangers of AI that we're experiencing now around bias and government use of AI and other things. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess it's not so those questions around uh, consciousness and other things are are interesting. And I think that, you know, someone should be having those conversations probably. In this year, it seems to have shifted the conversation more towards uh, those things and away from, you know, distracting from things that are really happening practically that are problems for us as AI practitioners. I agree. Yeah. So hopefully, I mean, I hope really that's a trend that is corrected or at least expectations are set a little bit better. I think it's started. I think that's going to keep going for a while uh, because there's a lot of people out there that whose lives are not nearly as entwined in AI as, as ours are, and they're just coming into the conversation. And so, but I think I think the bottom line is, to the best of my knowledge, there's no substantial research pushing forward consciousness. That's not what AI is uh, in the foreseeable future. So that entire line of speculative thinking, there's not really a basis uh, in fact for that at this point. And I think I think 
I suspect you and me and a lot of other people in this field are going to continue to have to message that out to people that are just really learning about this new for that to to get by. So I'm 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 pretty tolerant with it. I think it's just a question of ongoing education. So quiz, Chris, there in my mind were two huge things that rocked the AI machine learning software engineering world this year that really stand out to me. I'm curious if uh, those same things come to your mind. Do you know what I'm talking about? I can guess at it. We've talked a lot, so I'm probably guessing at least one of those I'm guessing is the GDPR. Yes, the year of the year of yeah. the GDPR. It's very exciting depending on uh, depending on your perspective, I guess. And for those who don't know, that's the European and the, and the EU, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the first large scale regulation of data and AI technologies out there. And it's it's certainly uh, it's certainly an imperfect with its it has people for and against uh, not only it as a whole, but different aspects of it. But we're now in a world where regulation and AI is is something to think about and consider and maybe a ra- reality. So that definitely rocked a lot of people on their heels this year. Yeah, if you're interested in, I mean, there's definitely implications for uh, machine learning and AI practitioners based on the GDPR around explainability of your models and what that exactly means. Some of the finer points and the details of that we discussed in in episode four with some individuals from the company Amuta. Um, I think that was really instructive and I kind of learned a lot uh, of, you know, what I should expect, at least in the near future, as far as GDPR from that conversation, but it, it made me, you know, consider that it's a serious thing, but maybe not, it, it tempered a few of my fears, I guess. So yeah, Matthew, Carol and Andrew Burt from Amuta definitely, from my perspective, they definitely schooled me in that. So I came away from that episode with a different perspective from the start of the recording, certainly. And that, that definitely helped educate me along the way. Yep. So what's the, what do you think is the, the second thing that uh, I'm I was guessing thinking you're thinking maybe Cambridge Analytica, because that was big, or am I on the you're, wrong track? You're reading, you're reading my mind. Yep. Am um, I? Okay. I wasn't as sure about that one. Yeah. So I think probably whether you were in AI or not in AI, you probably heard about a lot about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica this year, and a lot of snapshots of Mark Zuckerberg and with kind of weird looks on his face, which. Uh, was definitely an interesting period of, of 2018 for me. In a non-technical sense, I think that the thing that really stuck in my mind was watching some of the hearings associated with that and realizing that our U.S. Congress people uh, really had Have a lot to no learn. Idea. They really were clueless. I, w- I remember watching that on YouTube and, and other things and just going, wow, somebody, somebody needs to educate Congress a bit. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely an eye opener, but I think also it's it's one of those things where for us working in this industry that that utilize data and AI, I think we need to uh, kind of reset our expectations for what we we think people know about the technology that they use. And also, you know, maybe have a little bit more empathy as we're as we're creating creating technology, not really assume that people are totally aware of that they're always reading the terms and conditions or they know, you know, they know or expect how we're using their data and and that sort of thing. So I think that kind of uh, reset that empathy for me, I think. Yeah. You know, the other thing about 2018 that really struck me was the maturing process that the whole field went through, uh, everything from open source tools to how organizations were entering into this new space and trying to figure it out. I had a, a kind of a, as a personal, I had uh, previously, I had been with uh, Accenture and then I went to Honeywell for a while. And then I'm currently with Lockheed Martin. And as I've gone into each of these, then these are large organizations, you know, that with, with, with commitments to these technologies. And as I've gone, the maturity uh, of each one figuring out how it was going to do to have operations around these has had uh, has I've seen a lot of advancement considering how short a time it's been. We're now seeing uh, a lot of the large organizations involved offering their best practices, and and those are getting incorporated. And I know we've talked about those uh, that uh, a number of times in our episodes. So we're just seeing a maturing of this industry uh, going at at just breakneck breakneck pace as as well as uh, open source projects and frameworks that are advancing uh, at lightning speed. 
Yeah, I'm I'm just reading a list. We'll we'll put a bunch of links from this show in the show notes, of course. But just looking at a list from from one article about you know about all of the open source projects that were introduced or significantly updated this this year as related to AI and. You know, of course, there were uh, things like Horizon from Facebook for uh, reinforcement learning. There were various libraries for graph nets and other things from from DeepMind and just a, a ton of stuff uh, happened and was open source this year. And that's that's really exciting to to look at um, as, you know, a whole uh, toolkit of things that we can use in in 2019. Yeah, I agree with you. It's uh, compared to the beginning of the year, the number of different tools come out and the number of different, I guess, constituencies that they were appealing to, not just data scientists, but software developers, people in different programming languages, different ways of, of approaching it, whether it be uh, things like auto ML and, and you'd hear people that were talking about TensorFlow or maybe upcoming TensorFlow 2 versus PyTorch and that whole discussion. Um, it's really, really democratized the field in the past year, having so many new capabilities and tools to where there's now quite a lot of choice in in how you might choose to get into the field. Okay, Chris. So in 2018, of course, we talked about a bunch of amazing stuff on the show. We started the show, we recorded 25 episodes, we talked about everything from ethics to natural language processing to robots. What do you think we're going to be talking about in 2019? Or what do you want to see on the show in 2019? What are going to be some of the the biggest topics that you think are going to be coming across our desks this coming year? Well, I think a lot of the conversations that we have already started are going to continue to develop and grow and mature, not the least of which is the issues of trust, transparency, and there's so many aspects of that. There's 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 bias. We've already talked about regulation and different types of use cases uh, on how you use these tools. There, we've just started down that path, and I think that's going to be something we'll see a lot this year and a lot in the years ahead. A- any thoughts, maybe on bias? I know you. I've heard you bring up bias so many times through our episodes. I- I'd love to hear your thoughts on where that's going. Yeah, I mean, I think bias and also like government and large organization use of of ML is something that I hope we'll be talking about a lot. I think it's, um, you know, one thing that that I kind of think happened in, in 2018, as we already talked about, was people's eyes were opened somewhat through Cambridge Analytica and other things about some of the ways that we're using data. And if we're using data in those ways to do these things, whether it's in hiring or advertising or uh, social media influencing and all of those things, then bias in our data sets really becomes a problem. And also there's probably certain things that we really just shouldn't be doing. You know, we've we brought up the use case of government use of facial recognition a few times on the on the show. Of course, that's a big controversy right now. So I think people's eyes have been opened in 2018 to how their data is being used somewhat. And um, in 2019, I think there's got to be kind of more reckoning around how we can actually develop trust in systems based on AI methodologies. And also it's going to be, I think it's going to weigh on us as practitioners to make some of those methodologies a little bit more transparent and interpretable, especially, you know, as we're forced to more and more by things like GDPR. So yeah, I think 2018 was kind of a year of eye-opening and 2019 maybe will be a year of practical reckoning in, in some ways, I hope. I think you're absolutely right. Not only, I, I hope you're right. I would even say that, you know, we, we talked about, you know, so much of the conversation in 2018 had been around fear of AI and, and such. And I think that this is a big part of the solution to that is if we can focus on trust and transparency much more so than we ever have had to do with previous technologies and understand and explore what's possible and and then you know why we may not want to go down certain paths or how we do certain paths safely is really crucial. So I've been really happy this past year to see kind of the the ethics of AI be such a big part of the conversation and I really think that's going to continue going forward um and I think I think 
the realization that that has to be right up there with your technical solutions in almost every conversation is a big part of where things are going in the months ahead. And I know that we, you and I talk a lot about AI for good. We try to illustrate all the, the amazing. We've had so many guests that have done some pretty amazing things, in some cases, life, life-saving techniques that they've used AI tools uh, to achieve. And so I would like to see us do more of that going forward. Um, And I'm hoping that if we continue to have these trust and transparency and ethical conversations about the tool set as part of our, right alongside our technical conversations, we're less likely to make missteps. And and, and maybe the worry about fear-based outcomes will will start to diminish. Yep. Now, Speaking of of more trends for for 2019, you and I have have talked quite a bit. I have uh, I have confidence that that you're a real person, but our listeners have have listened to us and you know never met us in person. So um, likely this last year they would have assumed that we're real people because we talk like real people. But I think in 2019 the AI assistants and the the uh, way that they're able to be conversational and better uh, generative voice techniques and text to voice techniques kind of combined with these NLP techniques that we already brought up around BERT and other things. I think that's all going to be kind of a, a perfect storm to advance AI assistance and, and voice interfaces and such where maybe in the end of next year, there will be some at least some conversations we have where it's maybe not as obvious whether we're talking to a computer or a person. What do you think? Uh, No, I I totally agree. And we've already seen specific instances uh, of those happening. We obviously saw the demo. I think it was uh, Amazon. Uh, Is it Duplex? Is that maybe it was? Yeah. Yeah. We've had so many things this year where, where they were indistinguishable you know, that, that AI assistant was indistinguishable. It sounded human. And there's a number of organizations working on that. And then it, when you combine that with what GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, have been doing, especially on image generation, just last week, I was sharing a post that was had a whole bunch of, you'd swear they were real people's faces. I mean, they were indistinguishable from a photograph and none of those people were real. And if you take that kind of capability and apply it uh, within within a video context, and have this uh, this conversational capability that's evolved. Then, yeah, the the ability for us to distinguish between us as real human beings and and you know essentially AI assistants that are that appear to be, but maybe not. Um, and that obviously raises more of the ethical questions. And how do you how do you interact? What is that user experience? Uh, what should yeah. it be? When you when should you know you're talking to a human? Absolutely, and um. It also reminded me of something else. Um, I know that uh, a stat that I I throw out commonly at talks is that Gartner a while back was predicting that by 2025, half of all of our primary care in in terms of uh, medical attention would come through AI assistance. And I know when they first put that out, I was thinking, well, some of it, but I, you know, I, I don't know. But I I think they might be right, and maybe even most of our medical care, because if you have this ability to have that visual and audio experience that is almost indistinguishable from talking to a human, all of the uh, AI enabled medical capability that might be behind that, then yeah, I think, I think the way that we are living our lives in terms of seeking primary care and lots of other use cases really change over the next few years. And we may see a lot of that this coming year. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, a lot of that is going to come in the form of new products. I think for us on this show, one trend that I think has already started, but I think is just going to be a huge trend in 2019 is a focus on practicality. And by that, I mean kind of less of a focus on what can you do with deep learning in terms of research and more of a focus on how can we take these techniques develop good processes around them, integrate them into software systems, integrate them into APIs, integrate them into mobile apps. How can we train our, you know, our data scientists, our AI people better so that they're actually better at building things, not just good at proving out research ideas, but better at building things. And then also the development of, you know, kind of system integrations and infrastructure that will really support that infusion of AI products and the development of those AI products into a company's workflow. Totally. I think inferencing APIs 
prediction APIs are going to become so standard in our stacks, in our software stacks that are running our, our organizations, our enterprises, that it'll seem almost funny to look back, not too far down the road and look back and think, well, of course it was. It was kind of obvious. I think a lot of a lot of people are still trying to wrap their heads around that right now. We're seeing a, a race to the bottom in terms of commoditization happening right now. Uh, and in, in terms of democratization of the field, we've already talked about the the immense number of tools that came out in 2018. That only seems to be accelerating as we go into 2019. And that's allowed a lot of people who are not strictly data scientists by background to get into this field. And as you start having some software engineers and developers that have an interest in this moving largely over into doing inference-based programming, it will no longer be the domain of just data scientists anymore. And I'm, I'm hoping to avoid the hate mail from data scientists, but I think, I think that you're going to see just as once upon a time you had computer scientists focusing mainly on programming, and then that democratized early as the internet came out. And I think we're seeing the beginning of a similar trend where it will be accessible to so many more people going forward. Yeah. And I think it's, in my opinion, it's not. So I do think you're right in terms of a lot of this kind of uh, being a new layer in the software stack that's accessible to kind of non-AI experts. But I also think that there's going to be a lot of pressure on data scientists and AI people themselves to to really be more responsible with the way that they build things and additional tooling around that. So we had the conversation with Joe from from Pachyderm in episode 23, which is really an infrastructure for AI. There's projects like Kubeflow and others that are really meant to provide a platform for responsible and tracked and versioned and scalable both training and inference on common infrastructure like Kubernetes, which is a container orchestrator. Um, so I think that there's going to be pressure on data scientists and AI people to say, not just like figure out a good way to do this and do your research job, but to actually say, okay, you know, step into the role of actually building something that scales and can be integrated into our systems and be more involved in the, on the engineering side of things and maybe less on the cutting edge research sort of things. Although I, I'm sure that there will still be organizations that focus on research. I think people have figured out that, yes, we can apply AI in the real world, but we need some tooling and, and infrastructure around it. I think that that's going to increase this coming year. Yeah, I, I think the thing that's really driving this field is the amount of money that is pouring into it. And the reason that money is pouring into it is because you are, you're you're getting a return on your investment. So, And that is done by generating products and services where AI technologies are enhancing those. You know, they're, they're helping you better serve your customer. And so because of that, there will always, I think, you know, research will continue to grow. But I think the explosion of numbers of people, practitioners, who are getting in to generate their own products and services, just like we saw in the software engineering world, where they're no longer trying to figure out the new protocol, but they're saying, hey, we have a bunch of great tools now. Let's go out and make stuff and sell it to our customers. That's really going to drive it. And because of that, I think you're going to see so much growth on the product and service creation side. Even though both are growing rapidly, it will almost eclipse the research side because for every one that's doing research, you're going to have many, many, many that are out there generating products and services that they can make a profit on. So I think we're, we're, we're already starting to see us turning very much that way. And I've seen, even in just 2018, I saw a substantial swing toward that direction. It's no longer, at the beginning of 2018, a lot of organizations were just thinking about getting into AI. As we get into 2019, many of those organizations are now trying to do it. They're at least starting. And obviously they can automate it with AutoML, which we talked about maybe a little bit this last year, but absolutely, uh, well, I think people will be talking about it more in 2019. What are your feelings on uh, on AutoML? So for those that maybe are new to AutoML, there's a whole series of techniques that are kind of uh, lumped into this discussion around AutoML, which basically is kind of like machine learning on machine learning. So doing machine learning to kind of adjust or modify your neural network architecture, or the layers of your neural network, or doing machine learning to figure out the best sort of you know, loss function or way to do gradient descent or, you know, updates or, or whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of automatic techniques to kind of figure out these things. Up until recently, I think a lot of those were 
experimental, but of course there's there's products now built around AutoML. What is what is your impression about what what AutoML will be in 2019, Chris? I think a lot of organizations are just starting to look at it. And when it kind of came out, it rocked the world, you know, in terms of, you know, people going, oh, man, you know, it was a totally different way of thinking about this field as a tool. And it kind of it was a revolutionary thought. But I think we're I think it was the first of many innovative tools that we're going to be seeing in the coming years. A lot of them in 2019 that is making this field more accessible. I I think early on, there was a naivety uh, that because of the mathematical underpinnings and because of the the technical barriers to entry that it would that a lot of people assume that there would be a, a fairly narrow set of people that could engage in this but you're seeing these innovators in in this case AutoML it's Google just doing amazing work to make to make this this set of tools more accessible and so I think I'm a big fan of AutoML I think it has a long way to go and I think it will grow a long way as will many other similar tools. But this is one of the reasons I really believe that this field is opening up. It's becoming so much more accessible. So I kind of think AutoML is cool, disclaimer, but uh, I'm also skeptical about uh, its, you know, widespread use in, in 2019 practically. I think that it's interesting. I think it will be utilized in certain, in a certain limited set of scenarios in the real world, maybe those that are more, uh, more standardized. But uh, but I'm a little bit skeptical about its its widespread use. So hopefully I'm not offending very many people out there. I do in my mind, the thing that is would drive much more kind of uh, democratization of machine learning and AI is transfer learning. I think that's kind of the at least my mind in 2019, a lot of what's going to drive you know, application of of complicated machine learning models in industry is uh, is transfer learning, which is the ability to kind of take take a model that was trained on for one task and then transfer transfer it to uh, another task via some fine tuning. So that's my personal opinion. I'll I'll get that out of the way on this show. No, I think I think that's a fantastic point. And I, and we have discussed this in the past and kind of to reiterate, I know that in my own experience, transfer learning is almost the gateway into implementation because in reality, you know, a lot of people as they get into this and they are not neural network research scientists and they're going off and creating their own architectures from scratch, you might go into Google Brain and that is a very common thing for people at that level. But for a lot of mid-sized companies or, you know, it's a couple of people speculating speculatively getting into it and trying to talk their managers into it. What they're really doing is they're taking their framework of choice and they're looking through the example capabilities and saying, you know what, this thing my boss wants me to do, it's not so dissimilar from this example I see here. And they take it and they try to make the adjustments to get that to work in their own world and and, and move in. So it's really, that's how it's done in real life for most people. Yeah. And I mean, you've kind of brought up cultural shifts in that statement. And that would certainly maybe be one cultural shift. Are there others of those that you, I mean, you're probably more in a standard enterprise setting than I am (laughs) or have been over the the past few years. What do you see with regard to those cultural shifts in, in that setting? Yeah, I'm definitely seeing that. And I was at a lot of smaller or mid-sized organizations for a while. But in recent years, I've been with these large organizations and very much by design, super happy with where I'm at now because of, of that. But what I'm really seeing is that as the maturing of this field is coming about so rapidly and these data-oriented possibilities are getting to a point where they can affect the, the bottom line, that it's really changing how organizations are seeing this. It's for a long time, your analytics teams and data science teams were kind of a very back office function. And now we're seeing it move into the C-suite. Um, a lot of organizations are creating positions for chief data officers and chief artificial intelligence officers and such. And so, and they have a seat at you know the big kids table uh, where they can really inform the rest of the leadership team how how that's doing and that cultural shift is making its way all the way through the organization and especially in the technology sector in the various technology sectors but even moving into some that are not traditional technology sectors you're seeing um, 
data-oriented strategy and AI-oriented strategy being prerequisite. You can't do strategy without considering that going forward. And when you're looking at the competitive landscape in an organization, you have to assess not only what your capability, but what are your competitors going to do on behalf of your customers, their customers. And so it's really changing a cultural mindset we're seeing in organizations and and also allowing more specialization. You don't just have an analytics team, but you might actually drive to where you separate your AI team from your traditional data science team, from your analytics team, which might be doing more reporting or even something as specialized as prognostics. I work at Lockheed Martin and prognostics a big th- is a big thing um, since we're dealing with aircraft and other uh, other vehicles. I've seen huge shifts in a very, very short amount of time, and I think that's going to trickle down into smaller organizations. I don't think you have to be a Lockheed Martin to be thinking that way anymore. I think for me, maybe 2019 will be the year of stop you, of stopping to use uh, various terms like loaded terms like machine learning and AI and analytics and data science. Maybe I shouldn't say that since I co-host the Practical AI podcast, but all of these terms are kind of maybe they'll become clearer this year. But I think the there's so much terminology out there. Maybe, you know, maybe we should rebrand as practical data stuff. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound as sexy, though. No, I guess not. <laughs> I have seen people actually looking at the responsibilities in these different areas and what they're trying to accomplish on behalf of a customer. And seg- there are different ways of segmenting it. But And you could apply different labels if you wanted. But I've seen different functions, responsibilities start getting segmented out. And then people put the le- best label on it that they can for that. And I think I doubt we're going to get out of that in 2019. I think we we have a ways to go. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we've already kind of talked about one other trend that that probably is going to characterize 2019, but um maybe just kind of to emphasize a few elements of it. We talked about the voice interaction element, of conversational bots and that sort of thing. I think there's going to be a lot of changing relationships between humans and and automation or humans and services and and different things, you know, like robots, that's kind of taking some first steps, IOT devices that are all through our houses now and, and uh, smart speakers and watches and other ways of, of interacting with things. And of course, you know, a lot of augmentation of jobs. So we always like to stress on this podcast that it's not really about automating jobs away, but augmenting people to do their jobs better. Like, you know, in healthcare with doctors trying to get them to be more efficient or or have a higher accuracy of, of diagnosis or salespeople getting to uh, more efficiently to uh, high priority leads and, and things like that. So there is going to be a lot of infusion of these kind of updated interactions with machines and in, in 2019, which is something we've already seen and there's first steps towards that, but it'll kind of continue to be a bit of transformation and augmentation of the way that we do day-to-day things, I think. Yeah, I mean, coming from this field, that's what the data is showing us. It's showing us not that, you know, we're just replacing people wholesale, but but we're augmenting them with tools that make them much more capable than they ever were before. And and that is a, a theme that I'm seeing recurring over and over and over again in a lot of different settings. And so, yeah, we have, you know, we're already seeing IoT things. IoT is almost losing its meaning, in my view, because everything can be IoT at this point by putting a microchip and, and network connectivity to it uh, and, and doing some cool stuff in the programming. But robotics are really finally becoming cheap. I have a six-year-old who is in first grade, and for Christmas, she's going to get her fourth robot. And what, this weekend, we were uh, I was showing her how to use uh, Scratch, the programming language from MIT, to control a little Tello drone. It's actually my drone, but we were sitting there, and she was pulling things onto it. And so it's it's really, I know as a parent, it's changing the way that I'm thinking about raising my daughter. And ironically, it's tied very much into what I'm doing for a living here. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually thinking about what do I teach my daughter so that she will be the best of whatever it is that she wants to be going forward. And, and it's certainly changing. I have two grown kids, and the way I'm raising my first grader is very different from the things I was teaching my now grown kids because the world has changed out from under us. So we're really incorporating ourselves with these technologies on a day-to-day basis. Um, So far, we've seen, I would argue, we've seen very much a net good. I know people worry about that, uh, but I'm I'm seeing some pretty amazing things happen. So I'm pretty encouraged, actually. Yeah. And I think that's a good place to kind of wrap up our perspective on on 2019. I'm super excited to talk about all of these things in 2019 on Practical AI. I don't know about you, Chris. 
it's going to be a really great year ahead talking about all of these things that that really are impacting the industry and and new things and AI, exciting things, things that are really making an impact on our day-to-day lives. I'm glad that our jobs of uh, of hosting this podcast won't be automated away, at least this year. And i um, really excited to talk about all of these things. As you look forward to, to 2019, please let us know if there's any topics you want to hear about on Practical AI. Definitely let us know in Slack. Um, join our community on, on LinkedIn. And we'll be really excited to hear from you and, and interact with you this coming year. So congrats again on, uh, on 2018, Chris. Congrats again. We made it through this year. I know when we started it, we were both new at this and uh, we've come a long way ourselves. So um, I am really stoked. And a big thank you to Changelog for helping us get started with this podcast and doing a lot of the really hard work around editing and and, uh, production and marketing and all of that. So a big thank you to them for getting us up and running in in 2018. Definitely check out their other shows as well. It's totally a team effort. I'm really glad you said that. Everyone just hears you and me talking uh, from week to week, but there's a whole team behind us that makes this whole thing work. And I'm immensely thankful. I never realized what a team effort it was until I got into this. Awesome. Thanks for the review, Chris. And I will talk to you in the new year. Talk to you in the new year, Daniel. Take care. Happy new year. Happy new year. All right, thank you for tuning into this episode of Practically AI. If you enjoyed this show, do us a favor, go on iTunes, give us a rating, go in your podcast app and favorite it. If you are on Twitter or a social network, share a link with a friend, whatever you gotta do, share the show with a friend if you enjoyed it. And bandwidth for changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com. And we catch our errors before our users do here at changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at rollbar.com slash changelog. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to linode.com slash changelog. Check them out. Support this show. This episode is hosted by Daniel Whitenack and Chris Benson. Editing is done by Tim Smith. The music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at changelaw.com. When you go there, pop in your email address, get our weekly email, keeping you up to date with the news and podcasts for developers in your inbox every single week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. I'm Nick Nisi. This is K-Ball. And I'm Rachel White. We're panelists on JS Party, a community celebration of JavaScript and the web. Every Thursday at noon central, a few of us get together and chat about JavaScript, Node, and topics ranging from practical accessibility to weird web APIs. <laughs> you could just eval the, 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 the text that you're given, and then and that's a basic, I think that's basically what it's doing. What could go wrong? Yeah, exactly. This is not uh, legal advice to, to eval text as it comes in. Join us live on Thursdays at noon central. Listen and Slack with us in real time or wait for the recording to hit. New episodes come out each Friday. Find the show at changelog.com slash JS party or wherever you listen to podcasts.